Hello po, we're live na po sa Facebook page. Good afternoon, everyone. To start the program, I would like to read a quote from the book Yearning, Race, Gender, and Cultural Practice from the late feminist scholar Bell Hooks. We are wedded in language, have our being in words. Dare I speak to oppressed and oppressor in the same voice? Dare I speak to you in a language that will move beyond the boundaries of domination, a language that will not bind you, fence you in, or hold you? The oppressed struggle in language to recover ourselves, to reconcile, to reunite, and to renew. Our words are not without meaning. They are an action, a resistance. Once again, good afternoon to everyone who joined us today, both in the Zoom webinar and on the Facebook live stream. My name is May, your MC for this afternoon, and welcome to Spoken Into Existence, Stories as Acts of Visibility and Resistance. This webinar is presented by the Department of English and Comparative Literature as part of the Cal Bahaginan Research Forum in partnership with the Office of Initiatives in Culture and the Arts. Although speaking into existence is a phrase that is commonly uttered in religious circles, it echoes the secular truth of the power of words and narratives. Language and discourse shape our worldview which has material consequences, especially if these narratives prevail. But what happens to narratives that don't prevail? Those that are silenced for how they reinterpret and resist the status quo. Who hears them? And what effects do they have upon the world? 
Now more than ever, where systems of oppression, the digitization of social interactions, and the lack of clarity on the pandemic's end have resulted in isolation and unrest, we find ourselves seeking out communities where we can find companionship and a common cause. At the same time, there is a need to scrutinize the communities that we find ourselves in, particularly the stories that we tell to and about each other, so that we do not compromise both personal and collective needs. This afternoon's webinar features two lectures that take a closer look at some of these communities, specifically the community of undocumented Filipino migrant workers and a non-governmental education organization in the Philippines. By conducting research on these two communities, the lectures seek to shed light on how these communities have the potential to promote the value of collectivity while also scrutinizing their tendency to alienate and further individualize in an effort to reshape these communities as spaces for sustenance and liberation. Before we introduce our speakers, we would like to officially open this afternoon's session with a word from the College of Arts and Letters Associate Dean for Academic Affairs, Dr. Maria Corazon Saturnina Castro. Good afternoon, Dr. Castro, and you may now have the floor. Okay, thank you so much, uh, May. Uh, thank you for inviting me to this uh, 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 occasion, to this academic event. Uh, I just want to start by saying that um, in 2009, the college under then Dean Rio Almario launched the CAL Research Ag Agenda. Each of the five departments under CAL was tasked to formulate a research agenda for the college. More specifically, the objectives of this, college, of this project were the following. One, evaluate the direction of research done by the faculty and the students. Two, suggest a general research direction based on the vision mission of CAL for the various fields being developed in each department. Three, identify specific research domains or fields of research which can serve as reference of the faculty, students, and other researchers. And lastly, to suggest concrete strategies to support the research activities in the college. From the data collected by the five departments, it was noted then that the college still has much to accomplish and recommendations were made to encourage more research in various programs. Dr. Mejorilia, the proponent for the DECL, listed five points for the direction of the DECL research and publication with the aim of increasing the general output of publication. 13 years after, we see the realization of these points. The faculty members continue to publish articles books and present papers in conferences here and abroad. The research has, be, has gone beyond Philippine literature. And as recommended in the Dr. Horelia paper, the language committee endeavored to do more research on English language studies that resulted in the first language studies colloquium a few years after and a special issue of the DECL journal. Today, we listen to the research of two language study scholars, Irish Joy Deo Ocampo and Julie Hollow. Both just came back from the studies, from their studies abroad. Julie will talk about how the vulner vulnerability and resistance are articulated in the narratives and the visual representations of migrant workers online. It explores the narratives that are hidden by the workers themselves for fear of being outcasts, considered outcasts and left without livelihood. And Irish, on the other hand, will talk about how stories create learning communities that enable us to enact, that enable us to understand the plight of each other. Uh, her study investigates uh, storytelling practices that we enact and understand how we can claim the the power of storytelling to resist and subvert power systems that exist in society. The research of these two young professors 
go beyond theory testing that is so fundamental. That's a fundamental quality of peer research. The criticality and the relevance of the research to our own context cannot be overly emphasized. We definitely need more research like this. Congratulations to the Associate Dean for Research and Creative Work, uh, J, uh, Dr. Jason Petras, and the members of the Bahag Bahaginan Committee. As you continue to fulfill and help realize the objectives set by the college more than a decade ago. There is much work to be done but we are getting there as we continue to produce quality and publishable research. Thank you and good afternoon to all of you. Thank you so much for your warm and welcoming words and for that retrospective on research in the college, Dr. Castro. At this point of the program, I would like to introduce our two speakers as well as our moderator for this afternoon's session. The first lecture in our lineup is entitled Vulnerability and Visibility in the Online Activism of Undocumented Filipino Migrant Workers by Professor Julie Holo. She is an assistant professor with the DECL here at UP Diliman. She has recently obtained her MA in Women's and Gender Studies from University of York and Utrecht University under the GEMMA Erasmus program. She has done critical discourse research in the fields of comics, metaphor and migration studies with a focus on social movements, gender and vulnerability. The second lecture is entitled What Stories Can and Cannot Tell, an analysis of storytelling strategies within the civil society agenda to be presented by Professor Irish Joy Deocampo. She is also a faculty member at the DECL and UP Diliman and also holds a bachelor's degree in English studies major in language from the same university. As mentioned, she also recently earned an advanced master's degree in cultural anthropology and development studies from the Catholic University of Leuven in Belgium. Her research interests explore multimodality, critical pedagogy, and gender and development studies. Our moderator to help us facilitate the discussion on the lectures is Mr. Jean Aaron de Borja. He graduated with a degree in comparative literature also from UP Diliman where he now teaches literature and academic writing. He is currently taking his master's in Philippine studies at the UP Asian Center. His research interests are Philippine literature and English, affect and diaspora studies. I would like to take the time to thank our speakers, Julie and Irish for their time and Aaron as well for, for their time to moderate this session. So Aaron, you may now have the floor. Yes, thank you. Thank you, May. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for uh, joining us for this uh, Bahaginan. Um, we're very happy that you are here to listen to two very, I think, very important and very meaningful lectures from my dear colleagues and uh, friends, Julie and Irish. Um, but before we begin, uh, I'd like to read um, some reminders that you also see on your screen. Uh, to guide us um, in facilitating the program to have a smooth event. First, um, for participants joining uh, the Zoom webinar, please make sure that your microphones are muted. Uh, you may send your questions in the Zoom Q&A, which you'll find below, um, or in the Facebook Live comment sections at any time during the lectures. And there is a dedicated open forum after the final speaker, during which the speakers will respond to questions. So you're encouraged to stay until the open forum. And should there be any disturbance before, uh, during the live stream, please stand by. And uh, for those who are interested, certificates will be issued to those who will answer the post-webinar evaluation form. Um, a link to the form will be made available at the end of the live webinar. So uh, we will listen to the two lectures first and then entertain questions after the two uh, speakers have presented their lectures. And so now um, we begin with uh, Julie's lecture. Uh, the floor is yours, Julie. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. Um, I will share my screen now. Uh, uh, sorry, I could not share my screen unless this screen share has been. There we go. All right, thank you. Um, okay. <clears throat> 
All right. Uh, so good afternoon again, everyone. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. Uh, my lecture is entitled Vulnerability and Visibility in the Online Activism of Undocumented Migrant Workers. Uh, the lecture explores how undocumented Filipina migrant workers in the United Kingdom uh, engage in activism through visual narratives in social media when the pandemic halted physical and more traditional modes of engagement um, in 2020. In doing so, the discussion draws from theorizations of vulnerability um, under the context of ever-present crises and gendered labor and relates these to the affective dimensions of collective action. Um, it also touches on the perceived contradiction between uh, and incompatibility between vulnerability and resistance. Uh, in going about today's um, discussion, I have a couple of questions here um, that I will be attempting to answer or to, to navigate through the topic. Uh, so these are, how has vulnerability been understood and experienced? How do the experiences of undocumented Filipina workers figure into these articulations of vulnerability? How do undocumented workers uh, deploy invisibility through social media? And how does resistance play out in this contested experience of in or visibility? These questions arose from the context of, uh, as I mentioned earlier, seemingly never ending crises. Uh, feminist scholars anchor this, these crises onto capitalism, more specifically the predatory form of capitalism that we inhabit today, globalizing, financialized, and neoliberal. According to them, capitalism functions on the logic of degradation and thrives on the continuous destabilization of the systems that it produces. Um, this view, in my understanding, argues that capitalist futures will always be riddled with crises that shift and adapt to the ruins of previous ones, creating conditions of precarity seemingly without end. How do we live through such times? Or perhaps the question would better be phrased as, how have we been living through such times? So I chose to articulate this question uh, through the experiences of um, undocumented Filipina migrant workers uh, in the United Kingdom. And it was spurred by uh, how the current secretary of the Philippines uh, Department of Labor and Employment last year announced an offer for the United Kingdom and Germany. Uh, the Philippines will deploy more Filipino healthcare workers to their country in exchange for 600,000 doses of the COVID-19 vaccine. This bartering of laboring bodies for vaccines demonstrates the historical and hegemonic view of the laborer uh, as a material resource that the state can produce and manipulate for profit, which has historically been affirmed in the Philippines through export-oriented education and labor policies. The COVID-19 pandemic has thrown into sharp relief the contradiction that the Filipino workforce has been operating under for decades. Indeed, the lack of healthcare workers in the Philippines has contributed to the poor management of healthcare institutions that have become even more crucial in our population survival during a pandemic. In being sent to aid in the aging and sick populations in the global north, Filipino migrant workers perform an essential and crucial role in maintaining these societies. Social reproduction theory has been central in feminist thinking about this transference of caring responsibilities onto women from the global south. The concept of social reproduction covers caregiving, housework, effective labor, child caring, and other activities that maintain the social bond and well being of people to keep capitalist systems running. This theory recognizes the individuals and institutions that perform paid caring labor, and it is sensitive to the racial division of such. In the tableau of labor, home and work overlap as spaces of production and reproduction. And the Filipino worker is firmly embedded in the space that produces her vulnerability. So in the discussion so far, I've highlighted um, the geopolitical um, anchors of the vulnerabilities of um, Filipina migrant workers. But we should not also forget how this eventually leads to a very enfleshed kind of vulnerability, the threat of physical violence, death, and aging stories that we are all too familiar with. And all this as they 
extend to aging and ill populations um, in the global north. Vulnerability is weighing against one another. Um, in thinking through this complex dynamic of, of care um, and uh, labor, I was particularly interested in the concept of vulnerability coming from the Latin word vulnus, which is to wound, something that's grounded in the endurability of the body. Um, I was also led to think about how we articulate vulnerability in Filipino through kahinaan, nasusugatan, maramdamin, nanganganib. Um, words that portray our proximity to ill feeling, whether it's physical, emotional, uh, and danger. And development um, in philosophy and feminist theory um, about uh, our relationships to one another being the one that defines our vulnerability. So we see in this um, description of the range of definitions of vulnerability, a move from more traditional um, understandings of the body um, as, in, as endurable or as the site of vulnerability to our relationships to one another, our interdependencies, or the need for the collective in order to shield us from vulnerability. Um, how this transforms into current discourses on human rights um, in particular for this afternoon's lecture, is the need for, for example, migrant workers to take on, to publicly claim to be vulnerable, uh, which then has the tendency to reinforce paternalistic um, relationships amongst, between the state and these populations. Uh, at the end of the day, the, the bodies that we appeal to, to, to recognize our vulnerability are the same ones that have rendered us vulnerable to begin with. So in this sense, um, vulnerability in the mainstream presents a kind of visibility um, and shows us a double edge to this vulnerability. Uh, the visibility that claiming one's vulnerability in the public sphere um, can trigger the same injustices we are trying to expose. We see this in the responses to Black Lives Matter movements in the US and Europe and in the precarious social media presence of undocumented workers. Um, to add to this, the need for excruciating stories of pain and suffering to be articulated and seen in the endless and rapid online environment can bring up trauma as it communicates the severity of migrant conditions. So then we can ask, why do we need to represent so much suffering and pain? Um, and this is where um, the lecture tries to, um, to highlight the efforts of undocumented migrant workers collective. Um, through the visual narrative that you'll see um, later on, uh, we could read a certain turning away from these um, events of suffering and onto uh, opportunities and spaces for a coming together where different emotions, different affects bleed uh, into one another in order to inform um, resistive practices. So heading now into the specific um, experiences of undocumented Filipino workers um, in Europe, being and staying legal in the UK is a challenge given existing working conditions and employer relationships. Um, it is important for us to understand that being legal is not a fixed state. Even for people who are legally employed, their status comes into question when they alert state authorities of abuse. During the pandemic, Filipino migrant workers in the UK lost their jobs. Others saw their wages drop to less than two pounds an hour, which is less than a quarter of the UK's statutory minimum wage. Of those who were infected by the coronavirus, one in four were too scared to ask the National Health Service for help in case it affected their immigration status in the future. Until 2012, Filipino women could quit their jobs and find a new employer within the UK. Uh, but when the conservative government took over, they removed the rights of the domestic workers to change employers. Once they leave their employers, they will automatically become undocumented. So this exerts a specific kind of pressure on Filipino workers, whether they be legal or whether they are already rendered illegal um, through surveillance. Being seen does not singularly bring one into political and collective action. Um, it means entering into a field of gazes that could manipulate one's corporal and affective life. As a system of the state, surveillance depends on regimes of visibility and invisibility that surface existing threats and use cues to profile potential threats. 
These strategies manifest directly through the wide and stringent use of identity cards and passports at borders to the security and traffic cameras in urban landscapes that disproportionately affect the presence and movement of non-white, disabled women and LGBTQ plus communities. These lead young undocumented migrants to learn to be illegal, a process replete with ambiguities of visibility and invisibility, and which requires new daily routines, social patterns, survival strategies of mere tactics to get by. Because they are always being watched, getting by includes surreptitiously navigating public spaces in order to access their livelihood, healthcare, and social circles. So what you see on the slide right now are some of the narratives um, that I was able to, to glean from, from the research. Um, most of the undocu undocumented workers uh, are just confined to the home. They refuse to leave. Some of them even have not left for two years um, when the pandemic started. There's a strange navigating of social media where they can't afford to be completely present because of course they, they are illegal, they are undocumented, but they also could not afford to be completely invisible in social media because that in itself is suspicious. So in the end, they, they do um, strategies of prosthetic citizenship where they approximate legality and of course engage in black jobs. So the legal category of regularity or citizenship is ultimately defined according to that specific standard of employment, one that creates a strict binary between formal and informal work and stratifies migrant groups according to skill level. So these perceptions um, lead or these conditions lead immigrant immigration advocates to pressure migrants to represent themselves as exceptional, appealing to the sensibilities of the dominant population. So here we see that surveillance is not only enacted from the state, it's all uh, public opinions also part of the surveillance that undocumented migrant workers have to contend with. And in this sense, they are positioned in, a, in, in simultaneously having power and not at the same time. Uh, so how have they responded? to this potential, but also difficulty in asserting their rights. So the image that you see here, uh, banners Ayuda Hindi Dictadoria, um, that relates to the Duterte government's militaristic approach to the pandemic. They depict the women in the images as they are, posing readily for a selfie during a time of restrictions on physical and in-person meetings imposed by the UK government. One of the notable choices in this imagery is the blur blurring of the faces of the undocumented women, imbuing their physical presence in the image with the uncertainty and the complexity of giving and receiving aid for people whose public recognition might compromise their status. As viewers of the image, we are permitted to see inside her home, to know that she has made contact with Gabriela and that she has persisted through being undocumented in London all without us knowing her face nor her name. The use of images or more broadly, this reliance on visual representation to adjust the undocumented experience, in my view, operates on a political and ontological tension. What does it mean to be undocumented? Is it the same as being unseen? And does being undocumented or unseen presuppose a need to be seen? The concept of visibility has been deployed by scholars and activists in trying to account for the varied and often contested ways that marginalized groups manifest and or negotiate their presence in public. The political and socioeconomic vulnerability experienced by Filipina migrant domestic workers may be read in this instance as a kind of liminal visibility, one that is simultaneously contingent on the deliberate disappearance or naturalization of their social productive work that they do, and their marked racialized presence as, as migrants. They are at once positioned to be glaringly visible socially, yet they are productively and economically invisible. And one of the immediate responses to this liminal presence is an insistence on representation. So far, I have highlighted how the tenuousness of visibility is a manifestation of vulnerability in the way that visibility situates marginalized people simultaneously in a place of powerlessness and political potential. 
The social, political, and affective strain that this mode of navigating the public space imposes upon the worker shows the burden and struggle with, within attempts to be visible. Given this, I read the blurred faces of the undocumented women as a direct mediation and insistence of their complex presence. In a way, this can be read as a kind of self-censorship um, in line with how activists describe this response to, be, to being monitored by state forces. A deliberate partial erasure of the self in this way, politically and aesthetically, communicates the marginalized community's command of their own perception. This kind of representation is sensitive to the strategic potential of remaining just below the radar of state forces. Being invisible, of course, helps in regrouping and strengthening collective bonds in preparation for more visible action. The move toward a blurred visibility such as this um, also deconstructs the perceived binary between the power of visibility and the impotence of invisibility. Simply put, the blur registers one's presence as it evades recognition and surveillance. I read this even further to be an act of counter surveillance, akin to the ways that activists deliberately publicize their actions. In this context, Gabriela's act of finding and reaching out to women who have had to go in hiding from the UK immigration authorities to shield themselves from detention and deportation. In contrast to the previous image, we see in this image a, a calling out to the general viewer, in addition to the domestic workers themselves, who are part of Gabriela's main target audience, to support the undocumented campaign to regularize by signing petitions and writing to local members of parliament. This straightforward call deviates from the other posts in its primary reliance on, well, the single figure of the worker and text, instead of collective photographs of undocumented workers to do their political work. In contrast to the posts on A that show small moments of reunion or joy over the obstacles during the pandemic, these posts, this post place information front and center, leading the viewer to specific actions or resources that go beyond the online platform. How do these strategies and calls for regular, regularization and full citizenship figure into the counter visibility and community-led actions foregrounded in the previous post? So the conditions discussed so far show how visibility and vulnerability are interlocked modes of existence for the undocumented migrant worker. Attempts to evade visibility uh, from state forces necessarily enact a different kind of visibility. Gabriela interestingly employs strategies of counter visibility as they also call for regularization and the granting of full citizenship for Filipina migrant workers in London. We can read a possible tension between these two approaches. Counter visibility exhibited through blurred imagery and potentially transgressive unions shown publicly online draws its power from the practices of illegality that undocumented migrants have devised in navigating public spaces. While this second image relies on uh, campaigning for regularization and full citizenship for undocumented workers, focusing on the crucial lines of institutional communication that migrants must tap either way to have access to legal and financial help for their case. What, though there is a difference in, in the approaches here, uh, we see that Gabriela shows that an engagement with institutional entities does not foreclose possibilities of an activist and counter-visible organizing that strengthens the political agency of undocumented workers. Gab and Gabriela navigates this um, thorny endeavor by placing themselves in between the state and the individual and collectively organizing the undocumented community so that the precarious visibility that the process brings, whether this be through counter visibility, blurred imagery, or um, the outright call for regularization and um, physical and online demonstrations, is not born alone by the individual. Of course, there is no guarantee that these applications or the, the online protests will guarantee a favorable result. But, how, but what this shows is how these strategies foreground the needs and struggles of undocumented workers rather than their irregular status. I read this effort as a collective demonstration of counter visibility, one that recognizes a simultaneous vulnerability and potency of undocumented workers. So just to quickly wrap up what we've 
uh, what I discussed today, uh, vulnerability uh, from my perspective here is politically produced. It is unequally and unequally distributed through and by um, differing operations of power. So though all of us in a sense uh, can be injured or can be rendered vulnerable, uh, there are existing structures that compound vulnerability. Um, and these extend beyond the injurability of the body. Um, there, there are certain affects that we encounter, that we experience a relation to field of objects and, and passion, um, as shown by the, the, emotion, the, the joy of the reunion in the first post shown here. Um, and that is informed by the difficulty and excruciating stories. Um, that bring these people together. They, these affects do not cancel each other out. In, in fact, they animate one another. Both examples of the post serve subversive and educational functions. And here we see that contrary to the idea that vulnerability has to be eradicated in order for resistance to come into play or to, to accrue enough power, vulnerability itself is productive. And recognition of this vulnerability is itself the power to reconstitute it. One can embrace vulnerability by recognizing it and seeing how these moments of, of coming together and tending to one another allows collective possibilities and resistance. Vulnerability in itself is resistance. Uh, this is the end of my lecture, so I'll, start, I'll stop sharing now. Thank you, everyone. Um, and for questions, uh, I'll just wait for them later. Thank you. Thank you, Julie, for such an um, insightful lecture and truly um, a much needed conversation today. Um, I'm sure there will be a lot of questions on this lecture later on, which we'll read um, after we um, listen to the second lecture by Irish. So um, here's uh, Irish's lecture. Good afternoon to everyone who joined us in today's lecture. I am Irish Joy de Ocampo, and my presentation this afternoon is entitled What Storytelling Can and Cannot Tell, an Exploratory Analysis of Storytelling Strategies of Teach for the Philippines. So as an overview, um, the study is concerned with understanding how a selected NGO in the Philippines uses stories or storytelling to forward and promote its advocacy on education reform in the country. In 2003, an opinion piece by, uh, published by Friedrich Noman Stiftung quoted the public official from DepEd or the Department of Education who said, the quality of Philippine education has been declining continuously for roughly 25 years. Almost two decades later, the perception that the quality of education provided by state-funded or public schools is below average continues to persist. Meanwhile, in recent years, there has been a noticeable increase in the number of NGOs or non-government organizations that take on state functions, such as the provision of accessible and quality education in the country. Salaming points out that the emergence of NGOs often coincides with a viewpoint towards states as weakening or weak institutions, corrupt, inefficient, and unable to deliver development. Many education-related NGOs, such as Teach for the Philippines, respond to or capitalize on this viewpoint. I'd like to preface my um, next discussion by saying that uh, in 2015, I was also part of the Teach for the Philippines. So I was assigned to teach in a public school in Quezon City for two years. So uh, this analysis is also influenced and highly shaped by my experiences um, when I was a part of the organization. So TFP or Teach for the Philippines is a not-for-profit organization that aims to contribute to the fulfillment of the goals of quality education in the country. According to its official website, its main vision is to work towards a vision where all Filipino children will benefit from an excellent, inclusive, and relevant education. EFB frames the education discourse as a 
development problem by claiming that education is a tool to reduce poverty and improve the lives of people. Furthermore, uh, it also frames the status of the current education system within the narrative of deficiency, which explains why the goal of giving Filipino children access to education is a difficult one. According to the organization, 40,000 teachers are needed in public schools. And so to solve that lack, uh, PFP's mission is to enlist high potential Filipino leaders who can positively impact students' academic and life skills and those who leverage their teaching experiences to advance education reform. These uh, leaders then take on the role of a teacher fellow uh, and are assigned to different public schools around the country. They then embody the role of a public school teacher and carry out the obligations of one. However, they are not considered government or state employees because their direct employer uh, is PFP. The organization's mission and vision represent the civil society agenda as described by Alvarez et al. So the civil society is uh, serves to safeguard, protect, and promote the position of marginalized groups, especially in scenarios where the state and market have failed to deliver uh, their roles and their uh, uh, their roles to society. It is also the space in which people mobilize to bargain, negotiate, or coerce other actors in order to advance and promote their interests. However, in the recent decades, with the popularity of um, global aid and with different uh, structural adjustment programs that were introduced in the developing countries, uh, the existence of the civil society has been conflated uh, with the existence of the NGOs and thus their roles are also, are also blurred where there is now a, a phenomenon of an NGOization of civil society, although NGOs are only part of uh, the larger civil society that exists. So NGOs are gray zones of civil society because they provide the balance between the state, uh, private sector, the increased transparency, good governance, and accountability. Because they have a, a, an in, inevitable relationship with the state and the market, wherein the state legitimizes their existence in a particular place or a country and the market serves as the uh, main source of funding uh, ngos often are pressured to navigate this knot of tangled power relations so tfp as a as an ngo uh, or understanding tfp as an ngo is productive and insightful uh, especially in in investigating how it straddles the amb ambiguity of its role and how it navigates this knot of tangled power relations and also to understand how they prescribe what actors should do and how and to what extent they should act and participate so tfp um, or cuento uh, which is Tagalog for story or storytelling, is the primary instrument that the FP employs to highlight and demonstrate the work that the organization does. So on its website, there is a specific section devoted exclusively to the cuento of the teacher fellows and other members of the organization. So this is where the FP share their experience of being part of the movement towards education reform. They hope that through sharing their cuento, they will be able to give you a more complete view of what it means to leave your mark uh, and how it is to work towards uh, the vision for our children and for our country. So these stories portray how each teacher fellow champions the cause of the organization by overcoming personal and community adversities. They are written from the first person point of view and often take the form of like personal blog entries and they introduce real characters and enable the transformation of mere statistics into stories. So in this paper, I will expound on two main points. 
First, I will describe how TFP's storytelling strategy or cuento provides a space for education advocates to articulate the complexity of the challenges in the education sector and to demonstrate the need for multi-sectoral engagement in addressing the identified challenges. Second, I will argue that despite that space, the translation of on-ground everyday realities into cuento can obscure the shortcomings of the state and market promote the collectivization and highlight pluralism and tolerance among teachers. So for brevity and illustration, I chose four published cuento or stories to support my main arguments. So one of the FP's main slogan is hashtag para sa bata, and then another one is hashtag para sa bayan, which is translated to for the country and for the children. This slogan serves as a placeholder or an indexing system or theme for the stories that are published both on the organization's official website and the teacher fellow social media platforms. The stories become sources of knowledge that are grounded in the standpoint of daily life and offer portraits of the intimacies and the intricacies of the lives in the public school. I chose one story from Teacher Dre, as, as seen on the screen. Her placement school was in a region outside of NCR. Through the story of her first day in school, Teacher Dre provides the readers with a sketch of her classroom to illustrate how the learning process of students is hampered by insufficient infrastructural support and learning resources. So as a continuation, this story also profiles uh, the students or the children in public school. They are poor, they are sick, they are stigmatized. By providing this profile, the poor performance of students in public schools um, and in their academics are further contextualized. So this story by Teacher Dre com complements the organization statement on its website um, that explains the low promotion rate of students in public schools. By permitting the readers to symbolically enter her classroom, Teacher Dre establishes a contextualized understanding of the realities in the classroom. Her experiences also show how a teacher inspired to work hashtag para sa bata can make ends meet to address the problems at hand. Another excerpt, this entry by teacher Leslie shows another dimension on the problem of literacy, which is the lack of age-appropriate reading interventions. Her story belies the usual comment on the poor quality of teachers in public schools or low-effort teachers. Her story also demonstrates the lengths the teachers go just to accommodate the diverse needs of students. So as you can see, she has to teach um, a third grade class who ranges from age eight to 13, and some of them are even non-readers or have grade one reading level. So based on these um, um, excerpts, one can say that storytelling as a strategy allows teachers to contest the dominant framework of quantification and reductionist discourses, especially when education is discursively framed as decreasing in quality. Challenges and critiques against public school education are often presented in decontextualized abstract data that lack nuances and lean towards uh, simplification. These stories are able to map out the complexities that statistics-reliant data uh, fail to recognize. Aside from humanizing the problem of education, stories also function as a platform for teacher fellows to be reflexive about their teaching practice. The official government-funded public school teachers are often restricted by their position as state servants and by the rules of the CSC, for example, um, and are unable to articulate or verbalize their problems and challenges in the classroom. These teachers are not allowed to discuss openly or publicly, much less to criticize the challenges they face. If you remember a few years ago, there was a public school teacher who shared a video of her classroom and the toilet, rather the school's toilet or the bathroom that also serves as her classroom. And she was reprimanded by the school administration and DepEd for that. 
The teacher fellows, on the other hand, as representatives of NGOs rather than the state and also representatives of the larger civil society at hand, capitalize on their ambiguous role or their ambiguous um, identity and presence in the public school to verbalize these issues to a more public audience without uh, the same material consequences that the public school teacher teachers will face. So on some level, Cuento grants a margin of space to contest the dominant hegemonic practice in the public school system of silencing teachers. Uh, as a representative of these public school teachers, the teacher fellows Cuento also serves to legitimize the struggle of public school teachers around the country. When teacher fellows, um, however, narrate the hardships and challenges they and their students face, they tend to conclude in a tone of hope and possibility. So as you can see here in the excerpt from Chermel, where she talks about uh, being challenged, but also channeling the passion and energy in serving the nation through the public school. Teacher fellows tend to highlight and analyze costs and results, highlight success, and end with a personal call for interventions. It is notable to look at the linguistic constructions of these stories, the preference to write from a singular point of view, I, for example. And so the grammatical formulation of these stories shapes the cuento as a story of an individual's challenge and triumph, mimicking the common hero's journey trope. Although the storytelling uh, strategy of TFP provides a space to bring to life these different actors and highlight the subjectivity of teachers, the story template does not allow for the criticality of non-person actors. So non-person actors here refer to institutions such as the state as represented by the Department of Education, for example, and the market or funders. Because the storytelling is templated in ha the hashtag para sabayan index system, the state is seen more as a beneficiary rather than an underperforming institution. Even the FP's website, for example, lists uh, the, the Department of Education as a champion, which is their in-speak or jargon for uh, partners. And these stories only further push the role of the state into abstraction and obstruct the call for improved service delivery from the state institutions. The reliance on uh, constructed and individualized narratives also encourages the collectivization among the teacher fellows. Uh, unlike other education-related counterparts that have a more activist collective orientation, such as maybe Act, Teach, Act Teachers Party List or Content in UP, uh, the individuality of teachers in these stories are highlight, is highlighted instead. As a reader, you are drawn towards uh, the day-to-day -to -day experiences and challenges of public school teachers. However, these daily experiences are not historicized and politicized. There is a level of insularity and exclusiveness to the space of the classroom as a setting for the cuento without investigating how external institutions, uh, failure, for example, play a role in what happens inside one. Teachers are also discouraged from organizing and mobilizing towards putting forward their concerns, such as demanding increased wages or uh, requesting for the loading of administrative tasks. Although these concerns um, are implicit in the stories that are published, teacher fellows are expected to treat the state as a partner and not as an accountable institution. Teachers are also, uh, the hashtag para sabayan story template also does not permit deviation the, from the script because it already presumes the storyteller's commitment to work for the bayan. If you are working towards the vision of a better bayan, there is a concession or an acceptance or a normalization of the bayan as inadequate, weak, and underdeveloped 
and therefore requires additional citizen support and involvement. As you can see in this excerpt where um, teacher Mel is thinking more about what she can do for the country rather than what the state owes um, these students in the public schools. The disappearance of the state in these stories is indicative of the efforts to transfer state functions to NGOs. The reliance on government and private funding by the organization leads to depoliticization. Teacher fellows who occupy the space where state, market, and civil society intersect or converge are in fact in the most advantageous position to step outside the boundaries of conventional state-citizen relations. However, this position also works against this possibility. The pressure for the teacher fellows to remain quote unquote civil towards the institutional partners also increase. Although teacher fellows are aware of the systemic underpinnings and challenges in the classroom, as you can see here from the excerpt of Cher Carlo, where uh, he explains uh, that the problem is systemic, this, the problem of hunger, for example, is systemic. You, they cannot be too outspoken or too quote unquote political against the misgivings and shortcomings of these institu institutions. Speaking against the champions will be considered by the organization as uncivil or maybe even unacceptable because to hold the state accountable by articulating its inadequacies or vilifying the private sector or the fund private funders and their inconsistencies as corporations can run the risk of defunding and losing ties with the lifeline of the organization. Because these storytelling tropes police and restrict discursive practices that contest the prescribed templates, it fail, they also fail to foster political conversation and collective action among the teachers. In the end, hegemonic and unquestioned relations among the state, the market, and civil society are only further reproduced and reenacted in new guises. This does not mean, however, that teacher fellows are incapable of constructing narratives that contest these restrictions. The counter narratives exist. However, these narratives do not make it to the public space as, for example, the, the organization's official website. They are told and narrated in alternative and private spaces. So, um, so my personal experience is I recall how sometimes my co-teachers and I would meet up in you know the, the parking lot of, of the school or the nearby mall and then we will have organized our own briefs where we share quote-unquote unpublishable stories of uh, certain practices that are unacceptable in in the public school for example um, modifying certain documents or uh, requirements just to make sure that our students' families do not get delisted from the 4Ps or the CCT program of the government. Uh, we have to keep quiet about our other co-teachers who have to resort to other activities in order to increase their income, such as maybe selling some products. And uh, we, we have to make our own learning materials because the textbooks that are from from the office of the Department of Education have several or numerous uh, typographical errors or uh, um, content issues. And so these things we, we get to talk about but are not really written down or documented. So it is notable that these alternative spaces are physical. So, you know, parking lots, uh, other people's dormitories or houses, in contrast to the digital space that the organization provides. And so the spatiotemporal aspect of uh, the storytelling venue demonstrates that although counter narratives exist, they often are undocumented and unbound. So while it is not the primary or even intended goal of the FP to create a space to promote activist radical ideas by allowing uh, teacher fellows to enter the public school system and live uh, 
as a public school teacher and experience these challenges firsthand, there is in fact potential for the space provided by the organization to be radicalizing, though this might not happen within the two years or inside the classroom, but when they leave and they join a different uh, organization or a, a government office. So as a, to synthesize, in this presentation, I attempted to explain how storytelling or cuento as a strategy provides a space for education advocates to articulate the complexity of the challenges in the education sector and re resist the seduction or the hegemony of statistics. Well, at the same time, um, arguing that the translation of on-ground everyday realities into cuento can obscure the shortcomings of the state and market promote the collectivization and highlight pluralism and tolerance among the teachers. For NGOs such as PFP to truly create a space for writing genuine or rewriting genuine and grounded cuento, there should be a shift in strategy to result in a deeper, more rooted and historicized engagement with the larger systems in place. The act of telling stories should be continuously probed as it, it reproduces dominant practices and invisibilize the systemic violence. Storytelling should allow uh, forms of resistance against imposed templates and tropes and explore alternative tellings to widen the space of negotiation and mobilization for marginalized groups such as teachers, public school teachers, and thus really fulfill uh, the civil society agenda. With that, I end my presentation. Thank you, and I look forward to your questions. Um, thank you, Irish, uh, again, for another um, very important and insightful presentation. Um, you may, uh, for those of us, for the attendees of um, the of, of this afternoon's Bahaginan, you may continue to uh, post your questions in the Q&A box um, here below your Zoom screens. Um, but, so now the floor is open for uh, questions um, for our uh, speakers. Irish is also with us here this afternoon to answer questions um, despite the recording. Um, uh, uh, just as we um, uh, keep the questions coming, I think just as a way to uh, preliminary synthesis of the lectures we've listened to today, I think um, at the core of these lectures are really an emphasis for um, the collectivity of experiences, because there is a tendency to, when, when experiences are fragmented and are not just experiences, but politicized and oppressive experiences are individuated and fragmented, um, they lose um, uh, the voice that they can surface um, um, to holding institutions and especially the state and various non-person um, actors, as Irish mentioned, um, accountable and culpable for really the difficulty of the lived experiences uh, that have been depicted in this uh, in these lectures. No, um, we have a few questions um, from Facebook. Um, I will read um, one question is for Irish and then one question is for uh, Julie. We'll start with a question for, uh, for Julie. Um, in your presentation, uh, it is clear that social media is a tool for solidarity, but we also can't deny that social media is infamous for its questionable security in terms of our personal data, despite our best efforts to circumvent them. For those who are hyper aware of this insecurity, but still want to find solidarity in the same way that the migrant women do, how do we find reassurance in using social media as a way of communicating vulnerability? Um, thanks for that question. It's actually a question that I asked um, the organizers that I talked to. Um, I talked to both uh, org organizers from Gabriela London and the Grande Utrecht. And I had the same concern. Uh, I asked them, how, are we, are, how do you safeguard yourselves um, in your activism, um, given the, the many eyes, the many surveilling eyes that abound in social media? Um, one of their responses was actually to play into it. Um, they also looked into Facebook metrics. They also pay, had paid ads. They um, capitalized on the 
the mind data of Facebook in order to reach more people. So that's one of the ways that the, the, active, the collective um, in the research navigated through maybe the contradiction and, and the risk it is to, well, we're going to make it work for us. If they're going to be watching us, we're going to make sure that we are able to use the same tools to reach the more people, the same, maybe the people that are still in, you know, still have eyes, but are not as visible and are needing of this um, collective or the space of the collective. Um, if I were to answer the question from, um, from, personal point of view, um, I would say that these narratives are, um, they had to, one, they had to surface in social media due to the constraints of, of the pandemic. And so in a way, in entering this field, there is already an acceptance of that. And this is some of that risk. And it's something that's also mirrored in, in the statements of the, of the organizers. There's not much that they could do um, to, to fight against the, the field of gases that they are in. So what they chose to do is to just make sure that they are they have like secure lines of communication amongst themselves. So for example, not all of them have smartphones. Um, for the undocumented workers, not, some of them have like, you know, the, the Nokia phones, or they still go, they still write notes, they still pass them along through houses. So more analog means of communication as well as the existing online form is how they've kind of protected themselves as they engage as well. So um, when the collective is there, um, whether it be facilitated through social media, we can find ways of being under the radar, not online. So it's always a balancing of both online and offline is, is what we found. Thank you, Julia. And I think that this some uh, part of that is what is, escapes um, uh, the question, right? Because we are so bombarded um, every day, especially during the pandemic with the ubiquitous presence of social media, that it's hard to imagine that these modes of um, resistance really are possible, uh, even within and then uh, beyond the the online uh, space. Uh, um, the question for Irish is, thank you, Julie. The question for Irish from Facebook is, um, while the cuento of the TFP teaching fellows does get away with verbalizing grievances, is there also a tendency for these stories to be misconstrued as narratives of resilience? Considering how resilience is often used as an excuse for our government's ineptitude, how then can we share stories that subvert resilience into a narrative of, of critique? Wow, that's a, that's a difficult question, but thank you for the one who asked. Uh, but yeah, for, for the first observation, I do agree that, again, even the, the hashtag is for something, right? It's for the children and or for the state para sabay and para sabata. And I think this has also been co-opted so many times when we do something that is community-oriented or oriented to a receiving group. Um, I do, I do, and I do agree that it is. It's also, in a way, this exploited resilience narrative that is not only present in you know among teachers, but also during calamities, for example, in the Philippines. You know how we have hashtags like hashtag. Uh, tindog late, which is like stand up late for when there are um, typhoons or kaya natin to, you know, those things. So I, I understand that. Of, and again, that's also what I'm trying to critique because the stories are individual stories, um, not just of the problems, but of how these teachers in the end overcome. Because if, if you look at mo all of the stories, although I just chose for, they, there's always a, a, a call for like, this is what I can do for the country. And, and so I know it's been difficult, but my community has helped me. Uh, the second question though, is like how do we, again, I think just echoing Julie, like this balance of you know, um, appreciating and recognizing the subjectivity of these teachers, not just the teacher fellows of TFP, but you know, public school teachers around the country, but also making sure that these stories um, do not perpetuate systemic violence or tolerate systemic violence and, you know, um, transferring the responsibility to the individuals. 
And I, again, I think it has to do with collectives. Again, it, 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 it boils down to how, although these stories are individual, they, they all point to different cracks in the system. And, and again, just to echo the personal is political. And I think that's, that's probably what is missing or not surfaced as much is how when we talk and say, oh, we all experience this and this is also beyond uh, the individual. And though we find difficulty in these everyday challenges of being a teacher, th there is a reason why this is so difficult when it shouldn't be difficult, right? And, and yeah, so I, I think that, that that's my simple answer, but it's, it's been a, a question that I have also been pondering, like how do, we, how do we critique and create at the same time? So yeah. Thank you, Irish. Um, uh, I, I think there's also um, a link or a recurring uh, link in the two lectures, um, especially when Irish was talking about um, how uh, the cuento of um, TFP fellows are also um, contending with constraints about how public they can be um, for fear of surveilling is also a form of the kind of inv uh, navigating visibility that Julie was talking about in her lecture on how to become visible and for this kind of visibility to be a form of resistance. But at the same time, like you said, Julie, in your answer to make it work uh, for you, you know, which is really symptomatic of, um, of, of, this, of their experience of these vulnerable and precarious situations, making things work um, and not letting it, again, another recurring link of, asserting oneself and then constantly being co-opted by these hegemonic powers that we are contending with. No. Um, I, I, I'm not trying to oversynthesize it. It's just that we're waiting for a couple more questions uh, from the audience. Perhaps um, the audience needs uh, some bit of time to process a very, again, very insightful lectures, especially in light of what's happening today and um, the timing of this lecture, especially. Um, and, and with regard to that, perhaps we can talk about that as well as we wait for these um, questions, because uh, like uh, the two lectures have shown, um, collectivity here is, it surfaces these populations that these lectures are talking about, right? Um, when individual experiences are turned into collective experiences, we then see the problem as a structural problem and not just as a personal um, struggle to, to be overcome, right? Um, but, um, but I think there is also a, um, I'm thinking of this on the spot, I'm sorry. But there also, there's also a way, a peculiar way by which uh, the digital age that we are in right now and the, and the way the state works today, how these two entities are able to distort what collectivity means or what unity means in this um, collectivity. Um, and at the same time, while promoting this distorted sense of collectivity and unity, it creates further decollectivization as the lectures also have touched upon. So I guess my, the question here is just could you talk a bit about the process when you were studying and when you were writing the, the studies, the process of reframing what collectivity and resistance means in your work, um, how, how, uh, how you contended with these hegemonic uh, logics that we've described in the study and how to really uh, wrench it away from these um, distortions, you know, how to reframe what collectivity and resistance means uh, today in a world where it's so easy um, to distort these kinds of notions. Um, any, any of the speakers can uh, start answering? Julie? Um, yeah, I think it's such a, it's such a great question to, to kind of um, summarize and synthesize the, the two lectures in Irish lecture as well. Um, I feel like it's from the research process, I had to contend with it quite early on because, of course, how I wanted to conduct the research was through, um, you know, ethnography, like to to go to to London and because they are open to they are open to having researchers live with them uh, and help out and volunteer um, with um, the migrant workers in London as well as in Utrecht. Uh, but then, of course, the the restrictions uh, did not allow that. And so I had to contend with how am I go? Will I just be perpetuating this the the collective or you know instead of being part of the collective and have that inform the research 
from the very beginning, I had to start first by myself in, in isolation and then approach um, them through digital ethnography. Um, though it was very fruitful and eventually when restrictions were easing, I was able to talk with them, but not um, you know, experience exactly how they operated. Um, so because I, how I dealt with it is through constant um, communication and checking and being with, uh, going back and forth, whether it's through formal online channels or whether it's through text, um, whether it's through seeing each other um, in the streets, even though you're technically not allowed to, to gather with them. Um, so in that sense, the research process became, it was a struggle in the beginning to really embody the, the collective aspect of it. Um, but what quickly happened was the, the, the relationships that come out of digital um, platforms really do, really are able to sustain um, us, really are able to sustain people. Uh, and so one of the questions as well that I asked them, it's like, how difficult was it to to no longer be able to sit in a room with the people that you're that you're fighting with, your friends, really. Um, and they said, and it's also they said because Filipinos love social media anyway, um, that it wasn't that much of a, a struggle to migrate online because a lot of their functions already were online. Because of course, undocumented workers are not always able to go out. So in that sense, they are able to again make it work, um, make the 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 constraints find some cracks in the constraints um, in order to um, do the political work that they that they want. So, yeah. Thank you, Julie, for that very interesting uh, that sheds light on the way we've been navigating the constraints you know, of that not just the pandemic, but like all the lectures, uh, the both of the lectures have um, showed that the, all the interlocking constraints of race, class and gender that um, that impose upon what um, we try to do to survive this uh, this system. Irish, uh, your thoughts? Um, mine is uh, a little bit different because this is kind of this is this research or this study is really a, a step back for me and, and and a little bit of a retrospective of what I went through when I was also part of of Beach for the Philippines. So I think for me, like in general. The idea of a collective, this this paper perhaps is an attempt to document the unpublishable stories that um, my co-fellows who are also now doing other things um, to kind of maybe resist in a way um, with that because it, it, I finished the, the fellowship with the organization in 2017 and it took me three years to actually kind of sit down and you know, take a step back and understand also how my experience now from in the classroom and then going outside of it and looking at it from more from a more critical lens. Because personally, I, I do feel that, of course, I relate to this idea that it was it was me there in the classroom and that we had to do these things individually. But then at the same time, we also had to talk to each other afterwards. But it was also such a how do I put this? It was such a life-changing experience and not only positively, but also negatively. And, and there were instances of, of, of course, very violent experiences that are emotionally violent. But then I think for, for me, it was important that I have to revisit uh, that experience somehow that I experienced with my other co-teachers and and perhaps re rewrite that story in, in this research, if that makes sense somehow. Um, so I guess it, I think with stories, it's the, the challenge is not only to rewrite them, but also perhaps, uh, and for teachers is, is to perhaps, um, build a different kind of literacy. So the, 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 the critical rewriting is also in the critical reading. And as you mentioned, Aaron, Nona, even the stories of unity, for example, are read in, in a positive light, but in fact, it, it actually um, removes accountability from, from people in power. So, so I guess that's, that's kind of my take on it. It's, it's a re critical reading of, of the stories that I was, a, I was a part of as well. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Irish, again, for, and Julie, for answering um, this 
uh, the, the thoughts that I've been having uh, while listening to the lectures. And well, we all uh, we, we have five minutes left in case um, any um, audience member wants to um, include a question before we conclude uh, the lecture. But um, maybe just as we wait for, for more questions, just to take off from um, also what Irish has mentioned about how um, her study in turn has also become another mode of telling the stories, in this case, unpublishable and silent stories. And I guess um, we could also say the same for Julie, for Julie's lecture, how these kinds of studies are also a way of, um, of uh, acts of storytelling themselves, right? Who, who are now uh, studies that are now contending with the tricky endeavor that is uh, storytelling and then telling these stories in in very different ways. What I was also interested in in the lecture is, I think when we tell uh, stories, especially um, stories that were part of your studies, um, really lived experiences from our realities, what is ultimately at stake is uh, the truth about um, the experience. It's so storytelling is about telling truths. So I was wondering, since we've touched upon on the methods of the study as well, if you encountered um, some difficulties in, because I can imagine the complexity of the experiences that you gathered from, from talking to these um, people. And then at the same time, as a researcher, doing your job of really narrativizing um, uh, these complex stories that sometimes have contradictions, sometimes don't um, always add up and there are cracks. And so how do you, how do I phrase this question? So how did you uh, navigate this um, this difficulty of making sure that the truths embedded in the stories that you listen to, right, um, surface in the study without um, the truth of the study being really um, messy or, you know, um, still having a clear point and focus as, as academic studies require. You know, if that makes sense, um, <laughs> if my questions make sense. Um, Maybe I, I can start and then Julie can add. Um, yeah, well, I think first for the clarity, I think it, Julie and I shared that there's really, it's messy. <laughs> I think the, the, that's it, that, that's, that's I guess that to really try to capture the everyday is, it's, you, it's, it's difficult to, to put that into like a clear message. And I think especially for, for the groups that we work with who have, as you said, very conflicting experiences and, you know, navigating both uh, vulnerability, but also power and, and wielding this and trying to make sense of it. So I think the, the clarity is, is, is part, the messiness is part of, of, of the process. But for me, um, maybe just in the methods, I remember that I asked actually a staff from PFP to read to read a, a draft of this because I do understand that while I am um, reading the the whole thing as, as a, approaching it as a research study I'm still part of that organization and I would also like to, to ask for their thoughts and I also did ask the the people whose stories were featured in the analysis and and and, and so I, I was also had to be transparent and say that, well, I am featuring these stories, but I am reading them from a more critical lens and this is the gist. And, and uh, thankfully they were quite uh, supportive and they were curious as well as to what the outcome was. Um, they were, they're not here, but they told me before that if, if it's done, then I should let them know what my analysis was. So, so I think that that's part of it also, like having to navigate the, the consent and then you know, presenting this story as their story, but reading, uh, applying my own reading to it while also being part of the same organization. Yeah. And really being transparent about your own, your positionality of the researcher and how you are not separate from that, what you're studying. Right. Julie, yes, to jump uh, in the question. Yeah, uh, thank you, Irish. I think you've articulated a lot of my own thoughts as well. Thank you. Um, I think I just, when I was, Thinking through your question, I and the discomfort and the messiness, and I echo Irish's thoughts on this. Whenever I was having difficulty in, in the research, I just thought it, it should be uncomfortable. It, it this should be unsettling. Like I, this is difficult. It should be difficult because it's difficult experiences. 
Um, and then how I dealt with it, with the truth that, and all the truth, the contradicting truths that um, came up in, in my engagement with, um, with the workers is always to, as much as possible, let them speak for themselves. So in the, in the, in the thesis, there's all their um, words are presented, not as translations, but as they are. So which is a, a bit of a, a negotiation because of course the readers are could not speak Tagalog. So I was like, but I was very adamant that no, this will not be in the form primarily of translations. Um, and then try to explain it as, as simply and as bare, uh, as bare bones to the truth of them as, as I could. And then coming into the engagements already with my readings and asking them what they think of my reading. So it's not uh, that I, I talk to them first and then I formulate my assumptions later. It was more I read through uh, and I tried to come up with my reading of their social media posts. And then we process together if at all these were, uh, if my, what I read was there, if they had different intentions, and then have that reflect, that process of checking in at several points reflect in, in, the, in the research. So, yeah. And it's so, for lack of a better word, it's really so beautiful because in a way, what you and Irish are describing is also making the research process collective as well, right? By by really um, including um, them as well in the in the very writing and finalizing of this um, of this study. Um, we have one question from um, the audience, and perhaps we can end here, which is a very I think a very nice way to end the lecture because it circles back to the words of bell hooks. Um, that uh, premised our uh, discussion this afternoon. These are questions on language um, as well. Uh, I'll read the question uh, and then uh, Julie will answer the first one and then Irish the second one. For Prof. Ju for Prof. Julie Po, did it mean in your presentation that the rhetoric of we are suffering and vulnerable appealing to the state is kind of counterproductive because it reinforces the imbalanced relation to the paternalistic state and resistance? Or maybe the term resistance from inception has included that kind of rhetoric or discourse. Must discourse must find other forms. Sorry, po malabo and baka inaccurate. I'd love to return to your presentation soon in the future. Okay, I guess the question is uh, what this rhetoric of we are suffering and vulnerable meant, you know, appealing to the state. And then for Irish, uh, what kind of language might we look for? Na alternative for Prof. Irish, what kind of language might we look for in the alternative forms of storytelling ng experiences of teachers that go beyond or against the templates? We can begin with Julie's response. Uh, yes, thank you for the question. And yes, it makes sense. Uh, and that's part, one of the questions that I keep coming back to as well when I was writing it. Um, because it's true. It, uh, identifying yourself and claiming uh, vulnerability, whether it's um, you know, through appealing to NGOs and the state um, kind of makes you place into the language or place into the systems that have rendered you vulnerable. And so when they give you aid, you depend on them, you keep depending on them. Um, and one of the ways that um, the migrant collectives have tried to uh, address this sort of paternal power relation is really to also um, shore up these less than legal activities of, of coming together during a pandemic, for example, or um, embracing the fact that they could not completely count the undocumented workers in, in the UK and in the Netherlands, for instance, because there is that idea of how do you actually count undocumented workers? Um, and so for them, it was, well, it doesn't really matter. We don't really care for statistics as much or as, as much as the state wants us to, because then at least it's, it's more open and we could move below the radar. Um, so yes, there is that inherent in, in the appeals to the state for rights, um, the, the acceptance that, okay, uh, this is paternal and you, this, it, there is still some kind of power that is imposed on us. But um, as, as, as was also shown in the, in the other, um, post, the one that's not calling for the regularization, but the one that shows the blurred face, right? We see in that it's a difficult situation, but the, the emotion that they're um, communicating is one that is positive. So that's in contrast to representations of undocumented migrant workers, and this goes for asylum seekers and refugees as well, of being 
um, and very true stories of excruciating experiences. Um, that post in communicating anger and, and the difficulties of life during the pandemic for undocumented workers is presented in a way that foregrounds joy and, and happiness. So that's one of the ways that um, they intervene upon this paternalistic and kind of damning representation of what vulnerability is. Um, it's both excruciating and, and happy. They have arguments, but they come together at the end of the day. It's exhausting, um, but they smile and laugh through it. And it's just a matter of making those lesser known stories about vulnerability apparent. So, you know, a selfie in a very difficult time with a smiling face and a blurred one. So that sort of peculiar representation, I think, intervenes upon this relationship. Thank you, Julie. Very beautifully said. Um, and the question for Irish, what kind of language might we look for in alternative forms of storytelling ng experiences of teachers that go beyond or against the templates? Um, it's a really tough question. It's, 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 always, it's always more easy. It's always easier to, to question it, but the creation part is always a challenge. I've been I've been actually reflecting on that um for for a while, but but what comes to mind now I think is well first uh maybe to reimagine the storytelling practice as is um that maybe instead of making it an individual practice it could be a collective practice. Um, we have some already systems like you know zine making for example where uh people coll collaboratively create you know their stories, but I think also just to to map out, I think um, stories of maps, I think could really help. And so I think that when you try to um, to tell your story in a map rather than in, in you know the in, in the colonial Western way of you know having this beginning, middle, then it's always a resolution. I like the idea of of, of maps and maybe constellations of stories where again going back to the idea of messiness and and this idea this this resistance to resolution even perhaps that, well, there's it's still not resolved because the problem persists and, and these stories are mapped in institutional presence as well. So I think on top of my mind, those are the things that, that come to mind and, and how we can tell alternative stories and, and perhaps really highlight multiple voices. Um, it, it would be nice to have a collaborative storytelling where students and teachers and even administrations are are also uh, present, but yeah. Um, so I hope uh, those things that that really also uh, value the collective and 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 to decenter the 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 way we tell stories with um, this kind of hopeful resolution all the time. Thank you, Irish. Um, and again, really resonates with um, everything. Uh, in contexts bigger than the scopes of these studies, really the kinds of language and the kinds of resistance that we need to go against uh, the own hegemonic powers that we've been contending with, as well as the ones that have been depicted in this um, study. So on behalf of the DECL and of the Baraginan Committee, we'd like to thank again our speakers for this afternoon, Professor Julie Holo and Professor Iris Jocampo. Um, and that concludes the lectures for this afternoon. I now turn um, to our MC, Mami Cardoso, for the closing remarks. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, Aaron, for guiding us through that very insightful, very jam-packed discussion on the lectures. Really, really fascinating manifestations of solidarity, storytelling, resistance, visibility, and navigating all of the uncertainties and insecurities and all of those in-betweens. It's very fascinating just the way that we come together and tell stories, um, especially with changing times and systems of power. So very interesting. And I would also like to thank once again, our speakers, Julie and Irish for sharing their time and expertise with us. And to formally thank our speakers and our moderator, we would like to present certificates of appreciation on behalf of the Bahaginan Research Forum organizers. So first, this certificate of appreciation is awarded to Julie Holo for presenting her lecture, Vulnerability and Visibility in the Online Activism of Undocumented Filipina Migrant Workers in the Kalbahaginan Research Forum Spoken into Existence, Stories as Acts of Visibility and Resistance, 
given today, April 29, 2022, at the University of the Philippines, Deliman, Quezon City, signed by our Dean, Jim Well Naval, Dr. Dean Will Naval, and our Associate Dean for Research, Creative Work, and Publication, Dr. Jason Petras. So I will just screen, um, screen cap for the purposes of documentation. Make sure we all look pretty. One, two, three. Capture. There we go. All right. And our next awardee is Iris Joy de Ocampo. This appreciation certificate is awarded to Iris Joy de Ocampo for presenting her lecture, What Stories Can and Cannot Tell, an analysis of storytelling strategies within the civil society agenda in the Kalbahagina Research Forum, spoken into existence, given on the this 29th day of April, 2022 at UP Diliman, Quezon City, signed as well by Dr. Jinwal Naval and Dr. Jason Petras. So another screen share, friends. Three, two, one. Uh, there we go, thank you. And finally, our moderator, this certificate of appreciation is awarded to Jean Aaron de Borja for moderating our session this afternoon, spoken into existence as part of the Cal Bahaginan Research Forum given today on April 29, 2022 at UP Diliman, also signed by our Dean, Dr. Jamal Naval, and Dr. Jason Petras. So another screenshot, one, two, three. There we go, all right. Now, thank you so much to everybody. And as our program draws to a close, we would like to thank everybody in the audience, both in the Zoom webinar and our live stream on Facebook who joined us today. We hope that this afternoon's lectures and conversations were enlightening for everyone who tuned in. For those of you who would like to receive a certificate of participation, you may visit the link tinyurl.com slash bahaginaneval or you may scan the QR code that you now see on your screen and you will answer an evaluation form in the form of a Google form. In the form of a Google form. Hapon na po, sorry. You will receive your certificates via email shortly after filling out the form. So once again, the link is tinyurl.com slash bahaginaneval or you may scan the QR code. We will leave the QR code up on the screen um, until the stream ends. And I guess that's it. There we have it. Thank you once again to our speakers, our moderator, and all of you in the audience for joining us today for Spoken Into Existence, Stories as Acts of Visibility and Resistance. This has been May, your MC, and I hope that you have a great evening. Thank you so much. Well, and the live na po.